Hi, good morning TABC. We are so glad to be with you again today. My name is Jordan. I get to bring announcements to you and I'm here with Laura Dunn who assists me in children's ministry and today she assists me in announcements. So Laura, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Jordan. I want to talk about the prayer calendar. If you remember last week, Garen talked about the prayer calendar and how we were going to be setting that up on our website. It's set up. We've had a tremendous response on getting people to sign up for different times. We still want to fill that calendar up. So please take a moment, sign up for a time where you can spend some time praying with the Lord. Thanks, Laura. In response to the surveys that we got from you guys, we've decided that we are able to offer two online courses this summer. One is called emotionally healthy relationships, and one is called the marriage course. So if you are someone who responded and said you'd like help in those areas, we encourage you to try those classes out. They're gonna begin June 8th. You should be getting an email this week encouraging you to sign up. If you don't get that email, you can always reach out to our church office, and uh, we would just love for you to do those with us. And you might be wondering, what is it we're gonna be doing with the children this summer? Well, for the youth, grades 7 through 12, we are going to be doing a Marvel meetup. The kids are going to come together, or young adults I should say, and watch a movie each week and share community. We also are going to be doing VBS, which is grades pre-K through 6th grade. This is a great opportunity to do an online VBS where we weren't able to do a regular VBS. It's super simple. Jordan can do it. And if Jordan can do it, anyone can do it. I've watched the videos. They are super, super fun. The kids will love the games. It's also a great opportunity where families can reach out into the community to other families and bring them into their backyard. Some people may not come to our church, but they may be willing to come into your backyard for VBS. So stay tuned. We'll have more information on the youth Facebook page and the kids Facebook page for the two opportunities I just mentioned and also for upcoming opportunities. Thanks Laura. Last thing, we wanted to update you guys on our transition back to TABC. Um, the deacons have met and they've decided that we are going to begin our transition back during phase three of the state reopening and they have a soft goal of June 14th being the day we try and, and phase back in. So we hold that loosely. We know things can always change, but Lord willing, June 14th, we would like to begin meeting back here at TABC. So we look forward to that and hope that it can happen. So Laura, thanks for being with us. We are excited. You are with us too, and we're ready to jump in now. So let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to 12th Avenue this morning. We are excited to spend time together with you virtually. Hopefully, we're only a little ways out from being able to gather in person. But in the meantime, let's worship God together this morning.
As we're spending the next few weeks in prayer, um, this has always been a song that that stuck with me just about the way that we um, posture ourselves in relationship to God. Um, that a lot of times we carry around unnecessary weight and and burdens that aren't really ours to carry. Um, and so whenever I think about uh, this song and especially the time that we're in, I know that there is, um, pe- people feel a lot maybe more emotional right now than they than they do normally. Um, if that's not the case in my house, no no hints, Shay or anything. Uh, but I, I think but just a lot of people feel that way. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate that. <laughs> I think just a lot of people feel that way and, and are quite a bit more emotional right now. And so uh, as we sing this song, I want us to think about laying those emotions and laying those burdens down um, at the feet of the altar and, uh, and letting God take those off for us.
so that you can take it because you can handle that for us. God, we thank you for that and we love you. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, hello, 12th Avenue. Uh, I'm Brian Hollenbeck, and I'm chair of the missions uh, team here at 12th. And uh, today I've got uh, Ryan and Tara Lindsay with me. They are missionaries with the International Mission Board uh, in uh, Leeds, England. Uh, they moved there in 2012 with their kids, uh, Cor and Titus. And so they're just going to tell us a little bit about uh, how things have been going for them. So first of all, tell us uh, what was uh, life like for you all, uh, your ministry uh, pre-pandemic? Uh, well, I'd say pre-pandemic, we were uh, partially involved in university ministry. So I'm an official chaplain at the universities here in Leeds, uh, which uh, gives me access to about 50,000 or so students. And uh, so I'd have various meetings with them, uh, whether they'd come in and have questions about faith or just need somebody to talk to. But I also work with the campus ministry. Uh, I, I speak there regularly and, and kind of give them some leadership direction and, and kind of help them with ideas of evangelism and outreach. And then we also have other ministries here locally. So you want to cover that? Um, we have a fellowship that meets every week, um, which is just a few families um, from the children's school. And um, I also teach lunchtime Bible club at the children's school uh, once a week. And then we have various discipling appointments. We meet with people one-on-one, -on -one, um, train leaders and answer spiritual questions. And we coach several people. And yeah. That was all pre-pandemic. <laughs> okay. So tell us, uh, yeah, tell us how things have changed since uh, this COVID-19 hit and also just how are things in England in general for, for everybody? Yeah. Um, well, we now have the highest numbers of death in Europe, um, so we're hovering around 37,000 now. Uh, so England is still pretty locked down. Uh, the kids don't go to school, it's all online. Uh, our daughter's high school has already said they're not gonna return uh, this academic year, that, uh, at least to the building, but they will continue online. Uh, we also um, just have various other, uh, uh, you know, the university's closed, so we've had to to move a lot of those meetings online. Uh, so the it's, it has changed a lot, but I mean, just like a lot of people, church is now online. Uh, our Friday night small group that we started that Tara mentioned, uh, it's online now. And so but one of the cool things that's come out of that is because, you know, what do you do with the kids and the parents? Uh, because when we were all meeting in one house, it was easy enough to kind of have interaction, Tara take the kids and go off and have a, another lesson or, or something uh, and what's happened now is that actually our kids Cora and Titus write their own Bible study have their own zoom call with the other kids and so the kids run their own meeting separate and it's given them an opportunity to step up into some leadership and to do have a hand at what it's like to lead a meeting um, encourage and, others too yeah and so we've even had one of the other family's kids uh, lead the meeting one week so that's that's all been a real encouragement Great, We've great. also had lots of opportunities since um, COVID to get to know people in our neighborhood. Um, before um, the pandemic, we had a summer barbecue every year and invited the neighbors over, but that has really grown. Um, as it started, we had put like little postcards to the neighbors with some flowers and some Bible verses of hope just to say we're available if they need anything. So out of that came that every week we shop for at least two other families on the street and deliver them um, their groceries and things that they can't get easily. And we've had um, a street picnic and just done various things. 
Um, I was able to share the full gospel with one of our neighbors and we've had some a good spiritual conversations. Yeah. And uh, Ryan gets on WhatsApp because we have a WhatsApp for our, our Crescent now. Yeah, there's over a hundred people on the WhatsApp. And so every Sunday when our church is going to go live with the sermon, uh, with the, the, the teaching, uh, I post on the WhatsApp group, you know, hey, this is this is getting ready to go on. If you're looking for a church, if you're looking for a, a spiritual community, here's a way to get involved. Um, nobody's said whether or not they've joined, but, uh, but at least the option has been made available. Mm -hmm. well, what about the kids? What's uh, life uh, in England like for them, both before the pandemic and, and now? Uh. Now I say we are less... Um, Busy. <laughs> busy with their all their activities mm -hmm. um they really they're at the age 10 and 12 where they can get on with their schooling thankfully um with just having their own schedule and uh so while we have meetings they have their own routine for school um they get on websites and school sends them homework and then they've made their own clubs up so today they've had chess club on their own um music club um and so those were kind of things they did before and they've just continued it the two of them mm -hmm. titus uh he was playing rugby before um so we've tried to get more time out in the garden and and uh continue to keep that fitness level up but that it's they've missed being with their friends uh, that was something they really enjoyed and and but again because of their age uh phone usage is much more common uh, so they've been able to have, you know, video chats with friends and FaceTime and, and things. And that's been, I think, helpful for them. Interesting. Great, great. Any other things you'd like to share with us? Well, probably one of the biggest things, and, and 12th Avenue, you've been a partner with us over the last few years, is we always do a Passover meal. And that's really been a big draw of ours. We've always had about 50% of the guests uh, be atheists. So last year, uh, we had about 15 people come to it that were either atheists or just not involved in church in any anywhere. And uh, and we were really nervous this year because of the pandemic and everything shut down that we couldn't uh, have, have it. And then we decided, well, let's try a Facebook Live event. And so we did Facebook Live. We invited all the same people to it. And we still know of at least four atheists who joined in and partook in, in the teaching of the Passover, which has a gospel presentation. And so that was, that was something we were really encouraged about. And so we're looking at what does uh, digital engagement look like. And uh, we haven't quite got our head around it yet, but uh, we have talked to others who have started to use digital engagement across Europe as a real way of engaging people and sharing the gospel and, and doing some, even some discipleship. And so, uh, so that's something that we're excited about and looking forward to. That, just so you know, that can be anything from a Facebook page to a website. Um, it could be even be ads that people would see and then know they could ask spiritual questions and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. What, uh, uh, how can we be praying for y'all? I would say um, probably trying to figure out where the balance is. I'm sure you guys are in the same place of when do we start face-to-face -face engagement? How do we return to that? Um, Tara talked with a mom this week for about two hours who's nervous and anxious and, and really unsure about what does school look like in returning to school and is even opting at this point to not let her children return to school until September. Uh, they're, they're supposed to be opening up the schools the 1st of June. Primary schools. Primary schools. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think it's figuring out how to engage with people, how to connect with them. But I think also another one of our prayers has been people have just kind of taken it in stride, and they, they haven't mm -hmm. been as hungry or thirsty spiritually to try to understand this. Uh, and so that's one of the things we're praying for is that this really would uh, – awaken some people spiritually and kind of mm -hmm. sit back and think about life a little bit more. And, and, and so that's one of the things we pray for daily is people who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, that we'd be able to meet with them, engage with them to show them God's word and to, to, to see them come to faith. 
So that would definitely be a prayer of ours. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. okay. All right. Well, why don't I uh, pray for us then? So let's let's pray. Lord, I uh, just thank you for the Lindsays and that they're willing to uh, uh, uproot their family and and uh, go go overseas to to reach uh, the lost folks there in in England and and God, we do pray for uh, uh, for this pandemic to not uh, negatively impact um, their ministry, but maybe even bring about that thirst and uh, the spiritual hunger to. To, to know you better, God. So just help them to be in the right place at the right time to to answer those questions and to meet those needs as as folks might have them. And and however that might look with this uh, digital engagement, God, just uh, just guide them in, in knowing how to navigate that. And also just how to um, uh, return as as things do. Hopefully get back to uh, some form of uh, normal uh, here in the coming months, God. And uh, with all the anxiety and, and questions uh, with that, God, just pray uh, pray that you'll give them wisdom and, and all of this wisdom with what that might look like. And God, we just pray that you'll watch over uh, the kids too and, and just their day-to-day -day lives, God. Just uh, uh, we're thankful that they're finding ways to, to show those leadership skills and connect with uh, their friends as well and, and just uh, pray, pray for all those opportunities, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, 12th Avenue. We feel blessed and loved by you. Yep. And thanks for uh, thanks for watching, everyone. I'd just like to remind everyone that our missions conference, our team is in the midst of planning for that. We're still shooting for the end of October. And uh, of course, we'll see what that looks like in the coming months. But, but be uh, on the lookout for more details as, as we get closer. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We gather together as a community to worship God, to be formed by Him, and to be sent by Him. Our worship comes in various forms, prayer, songs of praise, hearing from His Word, and in the generous giving of our resources in order to advance God's work in our community and around the world. So we want to pause briefly today and have a generosity moment. Jesus told us that it's more blessed to give than to receive. The Bible teaches that godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We're determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not on the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds and willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasure that won't decay, but will shine in the age to come. In light of God's overwhelming generosity to us, we're now going to take a minute to give you a chance to give online if you so desire. If you're online with us at 10 a.m. on Sunday and you're part of our church family, you can simply click on the giving tab above if you're watching this later on YouTube, you can go to 12thav.org backslash give and give there or use the 12th Avenue Baptist Church app. Will you pray with me? God, you are the God of abundance. Help us to respond to your rich generosity toward us with generosity of our own. For your glory and the expansion of your kingdom in our community and around the world. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen.
Hi, my name is Ryan Kohlmeyer and I'm on the Deacon Board here at 12. And I wanted to let you in just on some of the conversation that the Deacons have been having and, and honestly I think probably a lot of the conversation we've all been having um, during this time of coronavirus restriction. And that is just how clear it is how built we are for relationships. Um, we need them to, to be healthy and this time dealing with these restrictions has definitely been hard on our relationships. Um, mainly because, you know, I think we all feel that the best way to maintain relationships is in a person-to-person -person and face-to-face -face manner. And right now we're just not able to do that. So um, a conversation that the deacons had been having and an encouragement that we decided to send out or an initiative, if you want to call it that, is just that, you know, until we're able to get back together and meet here at the church together, we would just like to encourage you that if you feel led to do so and are comfortable doing so, that you get together with somebody as you do church at your home. You know, invite somebody that you're close to at 12th over, do church with them, invite a family over and worship God together you know, on a Sunday morning or afternoon or whenever you, whenever you watch the service. Uh, we are calling this house to house um, simply because that's the way that the early Christians did it in the book of Acts. They met house to house. So clearly, um, along with that encouragement would be an encouragement to do this in a respectful and responsible way, um, recommending that you observe the social distancing guidelines and, um, and also whatever you know, limit obviously is placed on, on gatherings. At, uh, at any particular time. Um, but we feel like we can do this, we feel like it's important to do this, and so um, while being respectful and responsible, let's go ahead and take some, some first steps toward getting back together and, and worshiping house to house. Uh, Garen had asked me to read a passage for us, and that's Psalm 95, so, so here we go. Come on, everyone, let's sing for joy to the Lord. Let's shout our loudest praises to the God who saved us. Everyone, come meet his face with a thankful heart. Don't hold back your praises. Make him great by your shouts of joy. For the Lord is the greatest of all, King God over all other gods. In one hand he holds the mysteries of the earth, and in the other he holds the highest mountain peaks. He is the owner of every ocean, the engineer and sculptor of the earth itself. Come and kneel before this creator God, Come and bow before the mighty God, our majestic maker, for we are the lovers he cares for, and he is the God we worship. Ryan, thanks so much uh, for doing that. And also, Brian, thanks for doing the interview with the Lindsays. You did a really good job. It was great hearing from them, hearing that they're asking a lot of the same questions we are, trying to figure out a lot of the same stuff we are. So my favorite part of the interview, though, was the beards that you guys had to make yourselves look like look a lot like Jesus. Uh, sadly, all I have is the monk look going on here. So uh, a little bit jealous of you guys. All right, this is the time we want to uh, give you a chance to let your children go so they can get set up to watch the children's video while we enter into our regular teaching time. Hey, before we launch into today's teaching time, I just need to give um, a shout out or a thanks to one particular person. There's a lot of people we can give thanks to for right now. A lot of people who've really played really huge roles in helping 
our church and body through this time, but there's one person that's unseen to almost everybody but a handful of us who is by God's sovereignty we found out about who, who God rose up totally unexpectedly at the very beginning of this and who's been the person who's been really behind all of our online production stuff, totally unseen, again, to but just a few of us, who spends hours in the evenings at the end of the week, who sometimes is given a lot or a whole Saturday to making sure that thing works. Um, so I really want to say publicly in front of everybody that Bobby... Um, so thankful for everything that you've done more than you know you've been a really huge part of what God has done through this and so just want to tell you uh, thanks a lot I think I do it every time I get on camera the stuff that gets cut off but I just wanted to do it publicly um, so just thanks to everybody who's had a role but I just wanted to really publicly give you a shout out because we honor people and we praise God and so just want to honor you for all that you've done so okay um, we have begun a series on prayer that we are calling The Boiler Room. And a few months ago, um, can you believe it's really been that long since we first started gathering this way? Um, we talked about the rhythm of Jesus' life as taking, taking up as our own rhythm of life, that rhythm from solitude to community to ministry, from up to in to out, from the before life God the in-community life, um, and aren't we all longing to get back to that in an embodied way? And then the on-mission life, living from Christ to community to cause. And the first and most foundational of those three being time with the Father, abiding in Him. In my teaching two weeks ago on Daniel, we noticed his ability to live well in a very unsettling place, to live his life embracing holy uncertainty. And one of the key things we saw in his life that undergirded that capacity was a life rooted in spiritual rhythms and practices, seeking God's presence. To me, this is so very important. As such, this will always be one of my key ongoing challenges to myself, to all of us as followers of Jesus, to take upon ourselves the rhythms and the practices that Jesus modeled for us. For these are the ways in which we engage God and encounter Him and experience Him and are therefore transformed by Him into the likeness of Jesus. Now, throughout the Bible, throughout the history of the church, we are reminded again and again that one of the key practices that we can build into the rhythm of our lives is daily prayer. And that's why over the next several weeks, we want to, to, we want to each week to cast a vision for the importance of prayer. And then each week, we want to give some practical prayer practices that can enhance your own prayer life as well as your walk with God. So we want to call us to take advantage of what is left of this season to really dil drill down into this practice of prayer. And as I said last week, during this time, we will be calling all of us to a greater emphasis upon prayer in our personal as well as our corporate life as a family. I would like to see it become a greater part of my life and we would like to see it become a greater part of the church's life. And our theme verse for the next several weeks is going to be Ephesians 6.18, where Paul wrote this, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. That's a good, I think that's a good theme verse. And I said it last week, and it is worth saying again, we all know the importance of prayer, of conversing with God, we all know it, we should do it, and that there's a part of us, I believe, and all of us that longs to do it. But it's so easy to neglect. Uh, it is so easy to suddenly find ourselves stuck in a season of prayerlessness, like a month in, and like, oh, what, what have I been doing or thinking? So again, there's no shame in that. Because for many of the saints of old, many of them, they found their own prayer lives unsatisfactory. So... Uh, we're not going to sit and complain or wallow about it. We just want to try to grow in the discipline. So last week I tried to cast a vision for the necessity of prayer. And I want to just hit that briefly. Prayer is important for three reasons. Because one, it's essential to a life of growing intimacy with God. That's a pretty big one, right? Secondly, because a life of prayerful communion with the Father is what Jesus modeled for us. And he is the master and we are the servants. So that's a, the second reason why it's important. And third, I 
emphasized, this is the one really we camped out on, was because prayer is essential. Prayer is essential because it's the source of power behind all that we do. Again, the effects of prayer are real. I just experienced it again in my own life this very week. In fact, yesterday. The reality is that God responds to our prayers and our prayers have influence. They actually set into motion things in the unseen realm. Prayer truly is the power behind all kingdom work, behind all we do to advance the kingdom of God. And if you remember from last week, I talked about the fact that the 19th century British preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who each week peers over my right shoulder, he called um, prayer and his church's prayer gatherings the boiler room. Again, he was not referencing that noisy, dank, slightly creepy back of the basement room in Wilson Elementary School of Hayes, Kansas, back in the dark ages of the 1970s. I know those were the dark ages. Uh, the room where the school custodian kept some of his supplies. Not talking about that. Again, that in the 1800s when Spurgeon lived, steam was the primary power source of the day and boilers the primary source of steam. And the boiler rooms provide a power for everything from vast machines and factories to household heating systems. In the same way, Spurgeon believed prayer was the spiritual power that lay behind the effectiveness of his ministry. He was convinced of that. To him, his church's prayer ministry was the underground powerhouse that fueled the life of everything in his church. And it's not just true for him, it's true for us that the boiler room of prayer is what provides the power behind all that we do at 12. It should be, we want it to become more so. And the reason is because when the church prays, God moves. That's why John A. Wallace said, prayer moves the hand which moves the world. Or why the anonymous author of the Kneeling Christian book wrote, Satan laughs at our toiling, he mocks our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. Or why uh, Ravi Zacharias, the great modern apologist who passed away from cancer just this week, uh, a man who taught us to love God, not just with our heart and our soul, but also with our mind. Why Ravi said, if you're not a praying person, you must carry your faith. If you are a praying person, your faith carries you. Pretty profound. By the way, speaking of Ravi, Zacharias, if you are online with us each week, or even just today, and you're on a journey toward Jesus, and you have some questions as to the intellectual feasibility of following Jesus, I really recommend Ravi to you. If you're online, if you're online with us at 10 a.m., Click on the Learn More tab above, it should be up here, or go to the Notes, which should be to your right, um, where, where you see the chat. There's a little Notes tab over there, and you can click on the, the Learn More link on either of those places, or if you're watching this after the online service, go to the church's website, which is www.12thav.org, it's 12thave.org, slash learn more. And if you do that, um, you will find three excellent books that I reference that I really highly recommend to you. I was going to have one of them here in my hands and forgot. I'm just taking a quick look over in my apologetic section to see if I can quickly pull it out because it is red. Um, but I'm not seeing it right off the top of my hand, but it's in here somewhere. But I really highly recommend him to you if you are seeking, even if you're a believer and you're wanting to learn more about some of the evidence for the faith, he's a great place to go. So, okay, back to prayer. Um, this past week, in my quads read through the New Testament, it took us one day back to a story in 2 Chronicles 20 in the story of King Jehoshaphat and the Moabites and the Ammonites and with some of the uh, Mayunites and, and they weren't Mennonites, I double-checked, they're not Mennonites, but the Mayunites who came to wage war against Jehoshaphat and Israel. And I encourage you to, to open your Bible sometime today and read that passage, that Second Chronicles 20, and read the story, because it illustrates the power of prayer. Um, and as I said last week, all during this series, I want to be sure, though, that we're not just casting a vision for prayer and for its power, but I really want to be sure 
that we are being very practical, giving you things that you can use in your own prayer rhythm. So this week, we're going to get really basic. Um, I'm going to teach you an acronym that you can use to guide your daily time of prayer with God. A simple way to break it down into some easily identifiable categories. And I'm really doing this for two reasons. One, I have found that a lot of people who follow Jesus were never discipled as a young believer, at, at no fault of their own. And they were never handed down to them some of the basics of what it looks like to walk with God in real life in really practical ways. I'm thankful that I had that, and I've always believed in the necessity of teaching new believers some of those basic skills, um, things that can carry them throughout their faith, throughout their life. Now, there are going to be some of you who already know this, and you'll be like, I'm here this morning, Garen, for a medium rare sirloin with steak fries on the side, soaking in the steak juice, and you're giving me Gerber, Gerber baby food? Like, what's up with that? Um, but there really is a method behind all of my madness, and I um, know to most there is a lot of madness in me, but there is intentionality in most of all that I do, as mad as it may seem. And so there is a reason I'm doing this even for you who already know it, and this would be my second thing. Um, because there are times that we all need to be reminded of the basics, to get a renewed vision as to why those things are so important or how to approach them. Chuck Swindoll told a great story about Vince Lombardi, the legendary Green Bay Packers head coach. Those who played under Lombardi spoke of his intensity, his drive, his endless enthusiasm for the game. And on one occasion, his team, the Green Bay Packers, they lost to a very inferior squad. Lombardi called a practice very early the next morning. The men all gathered, sat silently in fear, not knowing what to expect from him. And Lombardi said this, Okay, today we go back to the basics. And holding up a football high in the air, he said, Gentlemen, this is a football. And I wish I would have had one, but I forgot to bring it. So it's just one of those days, one of those weeks. So how basic can you get, right? Holding up a football to football players saying, This is a football. That's like telling a carpenter, this is a hammer, or a dentist, this is a drill, or a ballerina, this is a slipper. Why in the world would a seasoned coach talk to professional athletes like that? Because Lombardi operated on a simple philosophy. He believed that excellence could be best achieved by perfecting the basics of the sport. The basics of blocking and tackling, proper technique, things like footwork, body positioning, leverage, and what works in the game of the football, I think works in the spiritual life as well. So enough said. So that's why I'm kind of going back to the basics, those two reasons. So I want to teach you the most basic parts of prayer. And when we finish, you'll have an acrostic that can help you in your daily prayers. When I was a baby believer, I was taught an acronym that guided me in my daily prayers for many years. It was very influential in my walk with God, and it still really influences me today. It was ACTS, A-C-T-S. I'm sure some of you know it or have been taught that. But many years ago, I learned a new acronym that I actually liked better. And so that's become my guiding framework for my prayer life and the way I teach the basics of prayer to a new believer. It's simple and it's really easy to remember. It is pray, P-R-A-Y. Praise, repent, ask, and yield. Praise, repent, ask, and yield. So, let's dive in. The first kind of thing we do in prayer is praise. To praise someone is to speak good words to them, to honor them for the qualities they possess or the things they have done. Psalm 146, 1 to 2 says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all of my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Or in Psalm 135, 1, and three, it says, praise the Lord, praise the name of the Lord, praise him, you servants of the Lord. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praise to his name. Seems to be kind of a theme to those two verses, right? Well, so we're to praise God, and that's the P of prayer. And there are two ways that we praise God. We praise God through adoration, and we praise God through thanksgiving. To adore means to love deeply. And adoration is just the verbalizing of my love for another. Psalm 29.2 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. So in adoration prayer, I'm praising God 
for who he is. That's a really important distinction. In adoration prayer, I'm praising God for who he is. I'm telling God the things I love about his character. It's just like when a boyfriend offers verbal adoration to his girlfriend. Sweetheart, the things I most love about you are your kindness and your sense of humor. Uh, I didn't say that very much like a boyfriend, did I? I've lost my practice. So some of my adoration prayers might sound like this. God, one of the things I most love about you is your holiness. Or, God, you're so kind and forgiving, always receiving, back, receiving me back to yourself, even when I failed you. These declarations of adoration should flow out of your di Bible, daily Bible reading, by the way. Let me give you an example. This week in my daily Bible reading for my quad, I was reminded in John 4 that God is truth. So in my prayer time, I simply said, wow, Father, you are all truth. That means I can fully trust you who you are and every single word that you say. And I love that about you. So just an example. But let it come out of your Bible reading. That is really, I found helpful. The second kind of praise, so the first kind is adoration. The second kind of praise is thanksgiving. In thanksgiving prayer, I'm praising God for what he has done. Not so much who he is, but what he has done. Psalm 30, 11 to 12 says, You turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and you clothe me with joy, that my heart may sing to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. I love 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, where we are commanded to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Even in the midst of difficulty, God tells me in Philippians 4, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, once again, my conversation with God is no different than my conversation in any other relationship. I was taught by my parents to always say thank you whenever anyone did anything kind for me, even to them. And it's the same with God. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. So each day, I take the time to, th to think about the things which God has brought into my life and to thank Him for them. Some of my Thanksgiving prayers might sound like this. Lord, thanks for the extra time I've had with the family these past weeks. Or, Father, thank you for all the beauty of all the flowers blooming in our flower garden. The display of your creativity and beauty is amazing to me. Or, God, thank you for providing us with another miracle vehicle for Kieran last week. I'm still in awe of your goodness in that. Okay, so first is praise. That's the P. Second, the thing we do in prayer is the R, and it's repent. Sometimes people refer to this as confession. 1 John 1, 9 tells us that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Great promise. So confess to God any wrong that you have done. Admit your sin to him. Agree with God that the sin is a sin. Call a spade a spade, so to speak. Don't hide it or try to excuse it. Just admit it. Express to him your sorrow for the way that it wrongs him that it hurts yourself, and that it hurts those around you. And then ask for his power and help in changing your heart and freeing you from that sin. And again, I hope you're hearing this theme in here. It's no different than any other relationship. If I speak unkindly to someone, I go to them and I say, I was wrong in the way I spoke to you, and I'm sorry if my tone hurt you, and I ask for your forgiveness. And as we do this to him, remember that he's a loving father who's waiting with open arms to forgive you and to give you the help you need to become more like him. So a confession prayer might sound like this. Dear Father, the other night I became inordinately angry at that young man in the Dairy Queen drive through who acted selfishly in a very brazen way. My internal reaction was extreme and I didn't think the kindest thoughts about that young man. I know that this person is someone whom you've created and whom you love, so forgive me for hurting you through the sharpness of my attitude. Please help me to guard my heart more carefully in the future. And if you haven't already figured it out, 
uh, these are real prayers of mine recently. Uh, so just stay away from Dairy Queen, okay? People don't do good things in that long line. Okay, so P is praise, and there's two kinds. There's adoration, thanksgiving. R is repent, or I confess my sin to God. The third kind of prayer is the A in the word prayer in that acrostic, and it means to ask. And I always begin, and I think we should begin our ask time by asking God to help others, to focus on others first. You may have a friend going through a difficulty. Ask God to help them and strengthen them. You may have a family member who's sick. Ask God to heal them. You may know someone going on a long journey. Ask God to protect them. Sometimes it's good, and I encourage you, sit quietly for a few minutes and ask God if he wants to put anyone on your mind to pray for. And if he brings someone to my mind, then I pray for them. Whatever the need, this is where I pray for the real needs of people that I know, to ask God to supply something which they lack. Um, now, so that's the first kind of asking. And that, if you were to give it a big church word, is what's called intercession. Intercession. Um, the other is called petition. Both kind of churchly, churchy words. Um, but that's okay. So intercession, that where I start in prayer for somebody else, like I just I gave you an example of. It comes from the word intercede, which means to speak to a third party on behalf of someone else. It's to plead um, someone else's case, so to speak, to a higher authority. So intercession is prayer that I offer up to God on behalf of others, just like I gave you an example of. In 1 Timothy 2.1, Paul says, I urge you then, first of all, that requests and prayers and intercession be made for everyone. Again, it's no different than any other relationship. My daughter tells me about a friend that needs a ride home and asks, Dad, when you pick me up, can we take my friend home too? Well, um, I mean, it's very natural. It's, it's something we do all the time. You know, we're very soon going to be entering a transition time as a church. Um, there will be a lot of unknowns, some really big decisions that need to be made by the leadership, by the staff, by the deacons. And we need wisdom in that. We really need your intercession. Trust me. Um, we long for your prayers at this time. So a prayer of intercession on behalf of the leadership of 12 might sound like this. Father, the leadership of the church, the deacons and the staff, they have a lot of tough calls to make over the coming weeks and perhaps even months. Please strengthen them and their spirit. Pour out your wisdom upon them. So, so we ask. First, I ask for others. That's the intercession, the big word, asking for others. But then I ask for myself. Um, and this kind of asking is called petition. Um, to petition is to ask somebody for something that I need. So let me quote again Philippians 4, 6, where Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So I've said all along, it's no different than any other relationship. If I need help moving some furniture, I feel com completely free to call my good friend and to ask them for help. In fact, someone just last week petitioned me on that very thing, on needing help moving a piece of furniture. So it's the same with God. I should feel com complete freedom to bring to Him the things which I feel I need in my life. So a prayer petition might sound something like this. Lord, we're needing to make a large purchase, but I don't want to move on it without you. I don't want to buy for the wrong reason. I really need you to speak to me about it. I'm not going to rush into it, but I'm sitting and I'm waiting for a word from you. Okay, so we have P, which is praise, and we do that through adoration and thanksgiving. We have R, which is repent, I confess my sin to him. We have A, which is ask. First I ask for others, which is intercession. Then I ask for myself, which is petition. And finally the Y, which is yield. In Romans 12, 1, Paul encourages us as believers to, he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your reasonable act of worship. So yielding prayer is where I offer up myself, my life, my body, my day, my time, my resources to be used by God for His purposes and for His fame. 
Yielding prayer is so important because it's so easy. I mean, we know this on our bones. It is so easy for us to go back to our default setting, which is self-centeredness. George MacDonald once wrote one of my favorite quotes, this, with every morn, my life afresh must break the crust of self gathered about me, that thy wind spirit may rush in and shake the darkness out of me. We need yielding prayer. We need it. Because as A.W. Tozer wrote in The Hunger of the Wilderness that I referenced in a Saturday video almost two months ago, I can't believe that long ago, he said this, the moral bent of the fallen world is toward godliness, not and defi but definitely away from it. It is not, sorry, the moral bent of the fallen world is not toward godliness, but definitely away from it. Is this vile world a friend to grace, asked the poet rhetorically, to help me on to God? And Tozer says the an sad answer is no. He continues this way. Only watchfulness and constant prayer can preserve those moral gains won for us through the operations of God's grace. The neglected heart will soon be a heart overrun with worldly thoughts. The neglected life will soon become a moral chaos. The church that is not jealously protected by mighty intercession will before long become the abode of every evil bird and the hiding place for unsuspected corruption. Uh, both powerful quotes to me. I mean, you guys know this. It is so easy for my life to get out of balance and for the sinful self to take control. So each morning, I must intentionally yield my life to God, expressing him to Him my desire to be used by Him in the day to come. Before getting out of bed each morning, Rick Warren, the author of The Purpose Driven Life, prays this, Lord, I offer my life to you today. Everything I do, use it for your glory. Lord, I know you're going to do some great things today. I'd like the privilege of just being in on some of them. But more important than that, I want to learn to love you more and to know you better every day. In yielding prayer with David, we pray Psalm 51, 12. Lord, grant me, please, a willing spirit. So, a prayer of yielding might sound something like this. Dear Lord, as I enter a new day, I want to again begin my day by yielding myself to you. It's so easy for my life to become about me instead of being about you. So I offer myself to you anew today. Use me in whatever way you desire. I have no idea what you want to bring into my life today, but I want to serve you today. I want to glorify you with my life. This is your day, Father. Help me to live this day for you. So, praise, praise, repent, ask, and yield. There's so many more types of prayer. If you're interested, Richard Foster's book entitled Prayer is a great resource. But those four basic components of prayer, that praise, that repentance, that asking, and that yielding, I mean, to me, those are, are some of the core basics. So, I encourage you to try to make these an important part of your daily prayer life. Just remember the acrostic, pray, P-R-A-Y. I begin with praise. I give him adoration, pra praising him for who he is. And then I move to a time of thanksgiving, praising him for what he has done. And then I repent, the R, confessing my sins to him. Next, I ask, the A. I begin with intercession, requests made on behalf of others. And then I move into a time of petition, requests made on behalf of myself. And finally, I conclude my time with the why by yielding my life and my day to him. So it's kind of a natural flow to this next question. I'm really curious, how did your exp prayer experience of kneeling prayer before phone go last week? If you gave it a try, I encourage you to give it two more weeks. That's how long it takes to make something a habit. If you didn't try last week, or you didn't hear last week's teaching, I really encourage you over the course of the next several weeks to begin the regular rhythm of your day with prayer, not your phone. Before grabbing your phone first thing, just roll out of bed, kneel before the Father as a physical demonstration of an internal submission and yield your day to Him. There's a lot of wisdom behind this simple practice. 
Just this week, I ran into a quote by C.S. Lewis that spoke to the need of this, where he said, the moment you wake up each morning, all your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning consists in shoving it all back, in listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing on. Isn't that a good quote? Second, prayer, Second Corinthians 10, 5, in that verse, Paul tells us to take our thoughts captive and to make them obedient to Christ. And kneeling prayer before phone is a way to do that, to intentionally direct my mind and my attention to God as the first thing every day. And finally, I want to encourage you to join us in the 12th Avenue Boiler Room, if you haven't already. We've created an online calendar to have prayer going morning to evening, seven days a week for the next several weeks. And we want to encourage as many of you as possible to sign up for a weekly one-hour time slot of prayer over the next several weeks. And again, please don't be scared off by the thought of praying for an hour. I just spoke this week to someone who said, I didn't do it, I didn't sign up because I don't think I can pray for more than 10 minutes. And I encourage them that it, it doesn't matter. God takes us where we are, not where we should be. So go ahead, give it a shot, sign up. And if you only pray for 10 minutes, that's great. Again, you have been in the presence of God, and that's something that He longs for. And here's why we're kind of emphasizing that. I didn't say this much last week. Hinted at it earlier. Um, the leadership of 12th is seeking God's wisdom and our strength at this time. It's been a very tiring season. So please join us in praying for our church in this most interesting of seasons. We, now more than ever, I feel it so deeply, we need the power that prayer brings. So if you'll simply get on the church's website, you'll find um, it at the top of the homepage, that word prayer at the very top. Click on that. It will take you to our boiler room. So trust me, God is longing to regularly meet with us in a very personal way. And again, I think deep inside, this is our heart's greatest desire. We just allow that desire to get directed toward important but lesser things all the time and so easily. So just let us strive to become a people of prayer, a people who walk intimately with the Father, conversing with Him every day. Let us become that house of prayer for all nations that Jesus longs for us to become. So if you don't mind, I would like to close with a prayer. So you can join me in listening in. Lord Jesus, we know that your dream is the 12th Avenue would become a house of prayer for all nations. But even as we come blundering into your presence in prayer, even right now, we're haunted by memories of duties under unperformed, of promptings disobeyed, of beckonings ignored, and of prayers unprayed. We are ashamed, O oh Lord, and frankly, we're tired of failure. Please make us, the people of 12th, into a people of prayer. Lord, please just slowly start that work in my own heart and all of our hearts. And Jesus, we pray this in your name because it is all about you and it's all for you. And God's people all said to that, Amen. So be it. So let's close with a, a time of worship where we can give God our praise, um, where we can give Him our adoration, and we can ascribe to Him the glory that really is due His name. So, Robert, passing it off to you.
on that rugged cross. you enjoyed the sermon as much as I did. Thanks, Karen, for giving a wonderful message as usual. And please sign up on the TABC website for the calendar of prayer. Have a great week, everyone. Yeah, thank you guys so much for being with us. It's always good to be with you online. We look forward to being together in person very soon. But until then, where you are, remember to live sent.